what really matters to God. In a small village inland from the great sweet book of Gower Bay on the South Wales coast stands a large old house. An elderly lady lived there alone once, and every night, so the neighbors say, as darkness fell, she put a light on in the attic. A son left home more than 20 years before, but she never gave up hope that one day he would come back. The villagers knew the house well, and they never saw that attic at night without a light on. Now, all over the world, the echo of that contemporary story is being played out. That's why, even though we don't know the elderly lady's name or the house where she lives, we connect emotionally with the truth. For we know prodigals. Quite possibly, we may be or have been one. A prodigal brother or, or, or sister, uh, a son, a husband, a daughter, someone who's just got up and, and went. And if we don't live personally with such broken relationships or fractured pasts, then we'll certainly know people who do. People who keep that light on in their hearts for the day when their prodigal comes home. It's the power of story to convey truth, which makes this well-known parable of the prodigal son so compelling. Jesus was, of course, a storyteller, because stories have the capacity to open a window in the human soul which connects us with heaven. And parables are much more than stories. They are signposts to the truth about God and the human condition. And in our parable this morning, two things become clear. Number one, God is the one who always keeps a light on in the attic, longing for the return of his children. And number two, we are lost prodigals. Yes, that's right, prodigals, plural. That's not a mistake. The mistake is to think that this parable is about one lost son. Actually, it's about two lost sons, the prodigal and his elder brother. And that's deliberate because this story and those before it in the Gospel of Luke chapter 15, the lost sheep and the lost coin, are told in the hearing of religious as well as irreligious people. If you like, the churched and the unchurched. So verse 1, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around Jesus to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So the shock factor for the original audience works at two levels. On the one hand, the tax collectors and sinners of verse 1, who are enjoying Jesus' company. They would see themselves in the prodigal son far away from God and would be completely surprised that God is longing for them to, to come back and is planning a party for them when they do. That scenario, of course, would be a massive shock to the Pharisees and teachers of the law in verse 2 who wonder why on earth a man like Jesus should be at home with undesirables like this. Which is why the parable works at that other level. Jesus tells this story not just to explain his attitudes to those regarded as sinners and who know they're lost. He tells it also to those who think they are saved, but in fact are just as lost. Now, they may never, like the young prodigal, have left the father's house, but they are far away from the father's heart. That's why this tale is so powerful, because it speaks to outsiders and insiders, and then completely redraws the circle. But here's a question. How does this parable fit within a series about stewardship and treasures in heaven? It's not remotely about money or the use of our gifts. Well, it fits because the story makes very clear what matters to God. And what matters to God needs to matter to us. And what matters to God more than anything else is mission, winning the lost, welcoming people who are on a return journey home 
to him. That's God's heart, and God will go to great lengths to see that happen. You see, the thing about the, the parables of Jesus so often is that they are larger than life. What do I mean by that? Well, take the father in the story this morning. Now, I know that dads love their children, but honestly... Do they normally welcome home so generously a long-lost son who's become a, a car-thieving, drug-dealing, womanizing waster without a word of, of complaint or interrogation? Do they really give them the keys to a, a brand-new Ferrari? No questions asked. Do they pay off their credit card loans? Do they celebrate with a street party? I doubt that even the best fathers in the world would go to those lengths. No father would. But guess what? God does. And if we don't get that, then we, we won't get Christianity. You may have heard the story of the, of the modern prodigal son turning up in the far country of a neighboring parish. The local vicar saw him and advised, now my boy, now my boy go back home to your dad and see if he doesn't welcome you and kill the fattened calf for you. So when, some months later, the, the vicar saw the boy again on the street, he asked him, well, how did it go with your dad? Did he kill the fattened calf? No, replied the boy, he jolly nearly killed the prodigal son, though. See, that's more, that's more like it. That's more like real life. That's the way many stories end in real life, but not this one. So let's look at the story Jesus told. Of course, the trouble with this particular story is that we've heard it all before. Let me try and freshen up the narrative a little bit. The younger son of a wealthy family decides he wants out, so he goes to the bank of dad. He wants his independence and the inheritance that will support such a crazy, crazy plan. He's decided uh, to embrace the life mantra, give me. That's what the younger son wants, to be able to do just what he likes. Of course, his demand to his dad, show me the money, was, was more than bad manners. His request meant that he was effectively wishing his father dead. Anyway, with his newly acquired assets hurriedly turned into cash, the boy heads for the bright lights. After some high living, he blows the lot and ends up without money and friends, forced to take a job mucking out pigs, which for a Jew would have been unthinkable, but that's how far this son and heir had fallen. Finally, with nowhere else to go, he heads wearily for home, but not for any noble reasons. A square meal and a, and a job on the father's farm, that's the limit of his ambitions now. What a mess he must have looked. Living in a cardboard box, his shoes rotting on his feet, Fingernails dirty, no family signet ring on his hand now. He sold that long ago for food. A threadbare, sweat-stained robe hanging lankly upon his bowed frame. But what a surprise awaits him. As the returning prodigal becomes a growing dot on the horizon, Dad appears. For years, his father had longed for this day, and when at last he catches sight of his bedraggled, exhausted son, love picks up its tunic and runs. His fears of news that his boy has been found dead in some back street are wrong. He's alive, and so the red carpet is rolled out. Friends and neighbors are invited to the mother of all street parties. Top sirloin hits the barbie. The band strikes up and dancing begins. It's so wonderful to have you home, sir. Glasses raised, everyone. My long lost boy is found, home at last, and the place is rocking, and everybody except the fattened calf is happy. Pause, change that. Not everybody is happy. Just as we thought the words, the end, were about to, to appear on the scene at verse 24, the happy reunion is cut short. This story has one more scene to go. And what a scene the older brother makes. Refusing to join in the, the celebrations, he's angry with everyone, particularly his father, whom he shouts at with verbal venom. He is furious that such a fuss is being made about this waster of a brother. 
uh, every day of his life. He's been at home keeping the family business going. And for what? Where is his party? His thanks. Not even goat meat for me, ever. And now he gets prime sirloin. The father is embarrassed and anxious. He has another prodigal son to deal with. A boy more messed up and lost than he even realizes. So with a nervous smile and outstretched arms, he pleads tenderly with his son. It all belongs to you. Everything. It always has and it always will. Don't you see that? Look, your brother's home. We're a family again. We've just got to celebrate. Come in and join the party. And there the story Jesus told ends, tantalizingly and deliberately unfinished. What happens next to Big Brother? We don't know. Does he go in and join the, the fun, or does he remain outside with that giant chip on his shoulder, outwardly conforming, but inwardly at war with himself and his father and family? That's why Jesus tells the story and leaves it open-ended. For he invites us, the listener, the reader, to respond. The two categories of listener, those who know they are lost and those who think they're saved. To the one, he says, come home to the warm welcome of the Father's house. And to the other, he says, come home to the Father's heart. It's marvelous stuff. No wonder theologians call this parable the gospel within the gospel. But let's see if we can nail the lessons as we wrap up. The lessons we can learn then from the story Jesus told. Firstly, the grace of God is unconventional. The grace of God is unconventional. At two particular points in the story, this becomes apparent. First, at the beginning, when the father, in order to raise the money for his son, has to break into the family wealth and generously gives the boy his inheritance early. What amazing love, which gives the son room to reject that love. A Near Eastern patriarch in the first century or any other would not act like this. Jesus' point is not that God is like an earthly father, but that God is like no earthly father that has ever been. Now hold that thought. Because the second example of unconventional grace is there at verse 20. Just as the prodigal has finally come to his senses and decides to return home. Though having brought shame on his family in the Jewish community and at every level humiliating his father, ruining the family business, the father's reaction is completely unexpected. It goes right against the, the cultural grain of the day. For the culture would have expected the ceremony called kazaze. That's Aramaic. It means to cut off. Kazaze was a, a ritual, rather like a funeral, for one who's not yet dead. Because as far as the community and family who pronounced Kazaze were concerned, the person was dead to them. And it could happen in this culture if a man sold property to a Gentile or went into business with a Gentile and that failed or married out of the Jewish race. Any future attempt to return to the community would be met by the ritual of Kazaze. Such a person wouldn't get within a mile of the village before the news was out and they were intercepted and turned away. And those equivalent rituals still exist today in near eastern villages. So when Jesus got to the point in his story, as the prodigal begins the long walk home, the crowd who first hear the story must have been thinking, Kazaze, anything else would have been impossible. He's lost, after all, all his wealth in Gentile country. And the prodigal knew that his only slim hope might have been the ability to work off his debt by taking on employment as his father's slave. 
That's what motivates his return. I am no longer worthy. Make me a hired hand. Absolutely, the audience would have muttered under their breath, Kazaze, cut him off. That's what he deserves. But look what he gets. Grace. Unconventional, outrageous, extravagant grace. Now, we use that word grace a lot in our Christian circles. It's a bit of a jargon buzzword, I guess. But what does grace actually look like? Listen to the text. While the boy was still a long way off, his father ran to him. Now, to these near Easterners, such a display of grace was embarrassing, unseemly, undignified. Near Eastern gentlemen didn't run in public. They still don't. And it wasn't just dignity that made a man walk slowly. Practicality prevented him from running. Men wore long robes that covered the feet. And so in order to run, one had to hoist the robes up, exposing the legs, which was considered in that culture shameful. And the imagery of a father running was so shocking that the Arabic translation of the prodigal story omits this picture of the father hoisting up his tunics and running. It simply states that the father went. And for a thousand years, the portrait of a father's skirt in hand running towards his disgraced son was objectionable. Yet, that is precisely the definition of God's grace. God's grace does not stand on ceremony. It does not wait with dignity. It pursues us, hot foot, because even while the prodigal was still a long way off, he was met by love that came running. Isn't that one of the fundamental meanings of the cross? Isn't this what the New Testament is driving at when it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you get that? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The prodigal in the story hadn't sorted his life out before the father came running to him. Oh, he knew he had to. He had come to his senses, realizing that the only way to turn was to the father's love, which he'd rejected. But he still looked like something the cat had dragged in. His life was messy and complicated and full of the baggage of of the past. He was still a sinner. But while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. You got that? The grace of God is unconventional, and the forgiveness of God is unconditional. Isn't that the most extravagant, outrageous thing ever? While we were still a long way off, dressed in the rags of our own rebellion, smelling of a life lived without much thought of the Father who made us, he came after us. The Father who has made us comes to rescue and restore us. So after hugging his son, it's the best robe and the best ring and the best shoes. He's not a servant, but my son who was lost but is found, who was dead but is alive. Grace is always extravagant, over the top, larger than life. Because it is. It is as high and wide and deep and long as the love of God. Now, why does Jesus tell the story? Well, here's another lesson. Because he wants prodigals to know that there is room in the Father's house for them. There may be folks in this morning who struggle to believe that. Because your track record is not great. In fact, it's appalling. You've done stuff and thought stuff and said stuff which which makes you squirm. You may be so distant from God in the far country that the idea of God wanting you back is frankly unthinkable. So I say to you this morning, think the unthinkable. For God is the Father waiting with extravagant, outrageous, unconventional grace for the sinner to return, for the prodigal to come home. But Jesus tells the story for another reason. Because he wants big brothers to make room in their hearts 
for returning prodigals. And I suspect that will be the majority application for us this morning. We, we are the church, the religious, the elder brother. We've not wandered into the far country. We've stayed in the Father's house for all these years. We have evangelical pedigree. We have years of Bible teaching inside us. We attend a small group. We are committed to the institution of the church. We pay our dues. And yet, if Jesus reads our hearts right, we may be as lost as the prodigal, if we only knew it. This story isn't just for other people. For the big brother attitude lurks inside each of us, ready to explode at a moment's notice. We may be in the Father's home, but sometimes we don't have the Father's heart. Maybe we see ourselves, actually the way the elder brother sees himself in the story, as a slave, not a son. Look, all these years I've been slaving for you. It's a duty without rewards. It's a tradition without benefits. It's a joyless affair. Is that the way you feel about grace? That it's not fair? This son of yours who squandered everything? Grace can be infuriating to a big brother because it invites people, does grace, invite people we don't like to know love and success and blessing who, frankly, we think don't deserve it. But listen up, no one deserves it. That's the point about grace. Not the prodigals, not the, the, the big brothers. None of us deserves grace, and yet both of us receive it equally. The older son had forgotten that. So he needs to be reminded, my son, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours, but we had to celebrate and be glad. <laughs> the elder brother can be a bit of a party pooper because he just doesn't get grace and he doesn't really want to. Not if it means the noise, the laughter, the fun, and the fuss over outsiders. And yet Jesus says in the previous parables, I tell you, there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 who have no need of repentance. Does that make us happy? Do we share heaven's joy? Is seeking the lost our priority? Because it's God's. It matters to him. Does it matter, therefore, enough to us that we are prepared to go to any lengths to bring the lost home? There's so much more we could say. So let me finish with these kinds of applications. Do we want to be, really want to be, a prodigal, friendly church? And number one, understand grace, get it, and live it. For we big brothers and sisters may need to repent just as much as the prodigals. We want to be a prodigal friendly church. That means being prepared for the mess which it involves sometimes. Do we want to be a prodigal friendly church? Then are we up for the song and dance and all the fuss and attention which making room for outsiders and newcomers and the lost generates? Dealing with people's baggage, having to welcome people we'd rather not because their arrivals create such a lot of extra work for us. Do we want to be a prodigal, friendly church? Then make mission a priority. You see, how much of our budget do we give to mission? To reaching the lost locally and globally? That's really what this stewardship season is all about. To get us to a point financially and structurally where we can be in mission mode every week, reaching the community and the nations. Growing a church full of people who want to find grace. Being prodigal friendly is about creating a church and a culture that is deeply committed to personal change and honesty. A culture which prevents people from walking away in the first place. That is sensitive to the battles that people are fighting. Of course that's a challenge. And the sad fact is that too often, because of our graceless attitudes and our joyless heart, the church creates prodigals and then sends them off into the far country. And then makes it really hard for them to come back. The author Rob Parsons, a shrewd observer of the local church, puts it like this. We need to pray 
that the returning prodigals will meet the father first before they bump into the elder brother. And right now, tens of thousands of prodigals are thinking about taking that hike home to God. My brothers and sisters, they, they need and deserve a welcome party to be surprised by love. Finally, do we want to be a prodigal-friendly church? Then always keep the lights on. Maybe in among the prodigals and big brothers in the church this morning, there are those of us who are waiting, fathers or mothers, husbands or wives, and we're wondering what went wrong. And some of us are carrying that heavy burden. And maybe you sit there month after month, year after year, waiting, looking, and hoping. Never turn off the light. Always keep it on. That's what God does. Lost people matter to him. Do they matter to us?